longer form. So, so uh, we use these skills, but applied to the thinking of an individual. The psychologist, he, he, he doesn't care about your thinking skills. I mean, he, you know, he wants you to speak about your life, about your pain, and maybe, and maybe you reason a little bit. That's not forbidden, but he, he, he doesn't want you to develop your thinking skill. That's not, uh, then again, it, it depends which type of uh, psychotherapy, right? But us explicitly, in fact, initially people come to, to, to solve problems, but slowly we'll take them uh, to develop their thinking capacity. And that's indirectly then, I would not call it solving, but deal with, with their problem because they both develop thinking skills and they develop a certain attitude at the same time. Because to think, you need to be less emotional, to be more distant, yeah? So that's what is philosophical. I, I, and tell me if uh, you see a problem f from the standpoint of answering your question, yeah? Uh, yeah, uh, so you have your word, used the words like simplifying, abstracting, conceptualizing, and one more term which you used was that a philosophical counselor should be outside the problem. I mean, he should not be inside it. Now, right. All, all yeah. these things go to one objective, that is a philosopher is concerned in theory formation. He's making a high yeah. theory formation. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. You're, you're outside, but you're inside too. You know, if somebody speaks about love and you never had an experience of love, I mean, you know, you're going to have a hard time dealing with it. So in a way, yes, you're outside, but I don't know if you're familiar with this famous phrase of a Terence, the Latin uh, writer who says, nothing human is foreign to me. So when people bring up issues, I mean, you 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 can share with them, you you, you know, you, but you don't sh become emotionally involved. But at least you you know which uh, existential experience it refers to. You can connect to it, but you stay outside from the standpoint of working on it and analyze it. Yeah. Let us bracket out existential philosophers for the moment because the lecture is focusing on the Socratic dialogue. So do you presume that Socrates might be an insider of the issue like justice, love, friendship, once he was having a dialogue with the sophist? Uh, I didn't understand the beginning of the question. Are, are you saying what? I was saying that let's bracket out existential thinkers for the moment yeah. because the topic is focusing on the Socratic dialogue. Okay. Now, what I want to ask is that whether Socrates can be treated as an insider once he was having that dialogue, let's say, with Tritatus or Carmides on issues like love, friendship, justice, yeah. and so on. But by insider, you mean that he's already familiar with it, or you mean he gets inside the thinking? I'm talking about the context. Should a person as a philosopher be insider or outsider? Well, I, I think it's got to be both, huh? like I said. Uh, once, because, see, uh, there's this idea of Kant that um, a concept without an intuition is uh, empty and an intuition without a concept is blind. It, this applies as well, too. You see, you have to do two things. You have to be able to identify a phenomenon, identify an experience, and at the same time, be able to name it and analyze it. Yeah. Now, some people they give words, and you want to put some cont You want to put some content in it. So you ask them, for example, when I said tricky to uh, earlier, I said, well, do you remember do you a situation where it could be called tricky? In that case, there is a concept. I try to find uh, a content to put into it. But sometimes it's the reverse. I say, well. You see, you did that. How do you call that? Yeah. So it's both. Huh? Uh, but for this, you, you got to have two skills, the skills of, of recognizing the phenomenon because you have experienced it and the skills to conceptualize it because you have learned think, thinking skills. So you, you need both. Right. And, and another way to answer that um, is uh, an idea of Hegel. Uh, where he distinguishes internal critique and external critique, yeah? 
external critique is when uh, I, I think differently and I'm going to produce a, a, com a critical comment, a criticism, an objection. Internal critique is I enter inside the thinking process of someone to work it from the inside. So there again, we have to be both inside and outside. Yeah, both. It has to be dialectical positioning. Yeah. I have a serious problem here. You cannot pick up the things from here and there. You cannot talk about Kant unless you talk about the transcendental unity of a perception, which was totally out of Socratic dialogue, the dialogical method. You cannot talk about Hegel's science of logic unless and until you bring in the notion of Geist. That's why I said we have to bracket out all the things. We cannot be smart enough to pick the things from here and there and make and give a complete recipe just like that. What is wow, you, your opinion on this? You, you're, you're a hard prosecutor on me. You remind me, my, my colleague. Well, the proof, you tell me I cannot. Well, the proof I can is I just did it. If I did it, then... I, it's a very empirical proof, as uh, Raja will say. I just did it. If I did it, I can do it. Yep. Now, but to be less provocative, uh, you see, I, I don't buy uh, in 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 the way we do philosophical practice. We don't buy whole systems like Kantian system or Hegelian system. Uh, it's more the idea of viewing the history of philosophy as a toolbox. Yeah, you know. So you can take uh, uh, internal critique and external critique from Hegel without buying the idea of the absolute idea. Yeah, you can uh, take the distinction uh, why you need a concept and the experience from Kant without, in fact, uh, for many years, I've been trying to read the whole of Critique of Pure Reason. I, I, I'm not, I, I have not done it and I don't think I'll ever be able to read the whole thing. But I picked up interesting tools, and that's fine with me. Yeah, and that's maybe a difference with uh, academic philosophy, where what's important is the system, the body of knowledge. And but okay, fine. It's another preoccupation. So if you find an interesting idea in some philosophers and you drop the rest, that's fine with me. It's a philosopher is a toolbox, not a system. Yeah, you understand the difference. Yeah. So, so, so you forgive me for transgressing those, those terrible rules. <laughs> I won't as an academic philosopher, but as a general spokesperson, well, that's okay for me. Thank okay. you. Yeah. But you know, when we train uh, people in, uh, in philosophical practice, that's one problem we have with training philosophers. They're too heavy. They're too heavy. So <laughs> We have to create some lightness, some freedom, you know? And uh, sometimes when they want to debate with me and they say, well, this philosopher did not really say that. I say, well, it doesn't matter. He should have said it if he didn't say it. So we're a bit, you know, light, <laughs> a bit light. I don't care if you find an idea of a philosopher that he didn't say, but it's useful, be my guest. You know, as a, a bit the idea of... Uh, you know, of uh, modern uh, hermeneutics, you know, who cares about the author? The reader makes the text, yeah? So, and that's, again, a difference we have. We're not concerned with some historical truth. We're concerned with what, as a reader, you can get from a philosophical text. Uh, just last question. Yeah. I'm afraid you are just names dropping in front of your clients so that a person may come in awe of the big names, like then it does hermeneutics, and then Hegel, and then Kant, and then Socrates, and maybe some is in front of you. What would you like okay. to say about that? Nothing. <laughs> I might be <laughs> dropping if you want. No problem. Yes, and it uh, if it's useful for a client to drop a name that looks smart, be my guest. You know, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> You're funny. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so <laughs> anyone else? Yeah, yeah. we have another. Uh, yeah. So, Janya, okay. ma'am, please. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Basically, I'm a psychologist. I do psychological counseling. So, I may not be using philosophical terminology or anything. But in the previous, uh, uh, what do you call that uh, 
session or whatever you say with madhulika you said that uh, you are a tricky woman you are tricking me aren't you judging there sir even in philosophical counseling we are not supposed we are supposed to be non judgmental non judgmental well here we have a problem and which it's a i'm glad you say you're a psychologist because that's uh, an issue that's very that differentiates uh psychology and um and philosophy you see uh, there again i'm going to be accused by my new friend to be name drop <laughs> but i'm going to bring <laughs> count in the discussion for whom judging is a fundamental action of thinking you see you cannot think without judging and judging in this case means to attribute a predicate to a subject does that make sense to you this sentence is to attribute a predicate to a subject or it's it's uh, abstract maybe you can little bit simplify it because i am i basically i was a, a student of uh, philosophy but it's been uh, years uh, that i've uh, stopped okay. reading philosophy no, no problem somehow i say something i check if people don't know. okay it means that uh when i say for example this table is round yeah the yeah. subject like grammatical subject yeah it's yeah. Uh, i'm speaking about the table table, yeah? <laughs> table. and I attribute to the table the qualification the predicate of being round yeah yeah so if you look all knowledge is based on this structure you mm. say things about things so yes. you're making judgments yeah you know now the meaning of judgment in in psychology is to avoid not to have value judgment not moral yeah. judgment because uh, people are nervous they're scared of being judged and so you say okay i'm going to protect you i'm not going to judge you which by the way i think is a big lie because <laughs> psychologists <laughs> judge anyhow they might not say their judgment but they judge anyhow but uh anyway but in philosophy no we we, we use judgment so Uh, sometimes i ask people to make judgments i ask them to make judgment and sometimes i use it in a bit of a provocative uh in a bit of a provocative way i'll throw something to the person like you're tricky and mm -hmm. as uh, it, it it has what we call a performative dimension that means that your words will create an action and actually uh i like a lot zen uh, philosophy where the a teacher he will throw something to the student to get a reaction from the student yeah and you saw that tricky there had a interesting effect uh, on yeah. uh, on madulika so the idea no it, it's not forbidden now if you make a sort of diagnostic this this and that very categorical like a doctor that's the problem so yeah. it's how the more it's how you use the judgment you use it as a performative thing to 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 get some uh, reaction get some effect or do you use it as some absolute authority yeah and in fact if you notice i say you're tricky and i asked her and i, I gave her a couple of example and then i examined with her what it means to be tricky you know so it's not simply diagnostic yeah so yeah. so judgment is welcome both from the standpoint of a client and from the standpoint of philosopher the only thing on the side of the philosopher avoid doing it too much because you'll be doing the thinking and second avoid uh, making it look like some absolute diagnostic but you you can use it yeah yeah thank you so thank you very much yeah good okay yeah but uh, one important difference as well with psychology that, psychology that once uh, sorry to interrupt you but uh, when you said that there is a i mean uh, dr prashant shukla was asking about the difference between a psychological counseling and philosophical counseling uh, when you said that there is a quite a bit of difference to which i don't agree sir we all okay. in psychology also we do things what because i was uh, i mean i in fact uh, told the bala sir that i am so impressed that uh, professor askar was uh, going in a methodical way as we do in a psychological counts okay well i'll tell you what uh, this kind of we thing are... uh, 
yeah, we do <laughs> analyze, we do synthesize, we do interpret, we do all the things. The skills, what you have taught, we do all the things in psychology also, sir. I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm just a psychological counselor. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know, but in the psychology... I don't diagnose, sir. I don't diagnose. I'm not supposed to diagnose. Uh, I'm not a clinical psychologist that I diagnose every client who comes to me as so-and-so. Like, he has a mental disorder or something. No, I don't diagnose. Okay. Fine. All right. <laughs> Now, I'm very cautious on this kind of discussion because, first of all, psychology <laughs> today has many, uh, uh, let's say, many uh, different uh, types of, of schools. You know, if you take, for example, a psychoanalyst and if you take uh, behaviorists, well, it'll be very different. And, you know, so always. But I can tell you by experience that we do have some psychologists that come to train with us. It happens because they think we have an interesting tools. Psycho psychoanalysts, no, they, 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 they cannot stand it. They think it's horrible we're doing because we, we use categories and they don't like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the thing in, in general, again, I'll be empirical. Uh, generally, often psychologists coming to see our, our work don't like it very much. Yeah, but again, the psychology again is such a wide array of practices that it's a bit meaningless to uh, make. But the, the thing though is that the the um, philosophy has focuses a lot on thinking skills. Psychology, no. When somebody comes to see a psychologist. He's not coming to learn thinking. He's learning. He, he wants to get a therapy. He wants to feel better. He wants to get over his problems. When in philosophy, we create problems for them. If they come with one problem, they leave, they have 10 problems, but very interesting problems, you see. So often I tell people, if you want to solve problems, don't come see me. To deal with the problem, okay. But uh, we'll find interesting problems. So there, that's one. And, and another one, very important too, about the judgment. You see, a psychologist goes against a therapy. If it's a therapy, you presuppose the person has a problem and he has to get to, to solve the problem. Uh, and therefore, you have to be nice, protect him. You know, he, the poor guy has got enough problems. In philosophy, we presuppose people are rational and therefore we can speak to them as a rational person and we don't have to view him as a you know, a person who is weak, who's vulnerable, who's this. No, a bit like you go to, to study martial art. When you study martial art, they don't presuppose you have physical problems. They presuppose you can go and be treated a little bit uh, harshly so you can exercise, yeah? So there's a very different attitude toward the other person. We don't try to protect them. We want to challenge them. Psychologists, less, yeah? Then you have provocative psychology, more challenging, but in general, yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay? Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, to this, oh. I agree. Yes. But don't be, don't be hurt. I didn't want to call psychology stupid. That was not my. No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> that was not. Okay. Fine. All right. You know, some debates get really hot, so I have to be a bit cautious. Take it lightly. Yes. Okay. So, anyone else? Anyone who has posted their questions in the chat, would you oh, like yeah, to I, I ask them in person? I saw one I thought I would like to answer. Uh, it's Val Sahili Singh who asked, is it a good idea to counsel people whom you have known already, such as family and friends? Yeah. Now, I, I think it's a good idea, you know, to, to start practicing questioning. You can do it with people around you. I think it's good, except... You have to be a bit careful. If you do it with your mother, for example, maybe your mother is not so ready to question her own presuppositions, you know. So from my experience, uh, lucky are the ones that can do it with their mother. Generally, it's a bit difficult, yeah, or your father as well. So, yeah, so you just got to know that it might be, you know, depending on the personality of the, the people. Friends, it's less dangerous because there's less emotional uh, issues yeah and but in the family it can be more more delicate so I, I say yeah try it but don't be surprised if there's emotional reaction and then okay maybe 
you have to be either very cautious or maybe it's not the best uh, not the best idea but but give it a try yes it's a good way because at first see uh the questioning practice it's it's a practice you got a question you got to practice questioning so like socrates whoever you find you know question them try to to practice yes uh, in fact oh, i had there was a banker a, a belgian banker he would invite me once in a while for dinner with his friends and they say come on oscar do your job with my friends and because he wanted to see how his friends react to know who are the real friends and who are not the real friends so he would invite me and this dinner was <laughs> it's sporty you know uh, yes, to, to see how people would react. And I did this as well in a more formal way in businesses uh, where I was invited to evaluate uh, the personnel, either people that want to get the job or uh, in-house personnel. And I would uh, do a little interview with them and see how they react and make a little report to the HR uh, responsible because we 20 minutes is sufficient uh, we could test the soft skills of the person, how he relates, how he thinks, how he reacts. Yeah, you know, but it was a bit provocative. I know the the the, the first question I often ask to people is say, they come in the room and I say, why do you come see me? So they're a bit surprised and they say, well, they told me to come. And then I say, well, do you do everything people tell you? You know, and it's a bit challenging, but it's a nice way to test people, see how, how they are. A, 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 a decent psychologist would never ask this kind of terrible question, yeah? So I say philosophical practice is more of a martial art, yes. <laughs> yeah, anyhow. So, anyone else? Yes, so there's another question. It is by Richa Priya. Uh, she asked that, can we relate Aristotle's eudaimonia to philosophical counseling? If yes, then how we can use it as a tool? If I, I didn't understand the beginning, is it written? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, if you can scroll up, it is by Richa. What's her name? Vicha. Vicha. Richa. Richa, R-I-C-H-A. Yes. Okay. Can we relate to Aristotle's eudaimonia to philosophical counseling? Yes, how can we use it as a tool for... Uh, uh, well, here you see, I would have to speak to this Richa, uh, Richa, are you there? No, he's not there. No, he's not there. Because you see, this kind of question, I, I mean, it, it would invite a very theoretical abstract thing. And that's the kind of thing I would speak with a person. It's a bit of an academic question, you know? And uh, I mean, it, it's it's interesting if you, you see you invite the person in front of you to commit himself to engage in the dialogue and see what he wants to do with that you see otherwise it's the kind of question you get in conferences people ask a very abstract thing and then the professor answer it makes a speech i'm not too big on it yeah so i will not answer this question it's for me it's too formal to i mean it's not uninteresting but it's too it's too general yeah so i would answer only if the person was still there yeah so uh and that that's the difference by the way with uh in philosophical pra we want a real dialogue with people not just speeches answering to speeches and smart things answering to smart things but uh um, socrates had this uh use this expression he said take off your shirt and comp for the body to body, like in a like in a martial art, yeah, you know, the closeness. And the academic world, closeness is avoided. And there's a respect, there is distance. Yes, you know, you don't you don't address the person, you address his speech. Yes, yes. Okay, fine. Anyone else? You have a you see a problem, you have an objection, something you don't understand, something weird. Allow yourself, I, I, I often I tell people, allow yourself to be stupid. Yeah, stupidity is good, simple. <laughs> yeah. You can as well just say, do, do you like it? You don't like it? Makes sense, does not make sense, you know, whatever. Yeah. Start simple. 
see, and as you see, the, the, the silence is already very interesting, you know, people mm -hmm. come to think, and that's a bit puts into uh, a light why the Socratic principle is so provocative, because huh? silence is a typical, uh, in private, little discussion, people speak, but as soon as there is, you know, a bit of, uh, okay, we're going to listen, we're going to analyze, you know, people get, get nervous and scared, yeah. But I have this theory that the fear of stupidity is one of the worst, or looking stupid, is one of the biggest fear in human existence, yes. Uh, especially people who are supposed to be smart, like in a university. <laughs> yeah. If somebody's really scared, you can put your question in the chat. Yes, so we have a, yeah, Pravajya, please ask. Uh, hello, sir. I just ha uh, have a comment to make that the word provocative that you just said, I think for me, it's the perfect word to describe this method. Because the more you provoke someone, the you know more intense the reaction is. So from what I could uh, get from this workshop as well as the conference earlier, I think the word suits this method perfectly. So that is all I wanted to say. Yeah, well, it's true and it's not true because you see, I always check with people after what did they think this and take what Madulika says, you know, he says, oh yeah, no, it was relaxing. And one notice, one thing I've noticed is what I call, well, I, it's called secondary emotions where people that watch are much more emotional, reacting emotionally than people that do it. And you see, because the person that do it, at least they get into it, they get in the process, they think. But the people outside say, oh my God, if it was me, what would I do? Oh, it's terrible, the poor, the poor. I see this a lot when I do philosophy with children, yeah? Uh, I'll tell you a funny story it happened in Norway once. I was doing a workshop with the kids and, um, and the teachers are watching. And after that, I spoke with the teachers and uh, uh, the teacher of the classroom I had worked with, she came back and she told the other teacher, say, you know what? They liked it. <laughs> she could not believe that the children enjoy the workshop. Why? Because those teachers, they you know they're supposed to be smart. They're supposed to know. And they say, oh, my God, what would I do if Oscar would ask me this kind of question? But children have less this problem. They're, first of all, they're used to some authority. They're used to, to look uh, stupid. They're used to play games. But those teachers, the teacher cannot believe the, 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 the children I liked it. And I often notice this, the person more emotionally is not the person doing the, the but people watching, yeah, who, who get nervous. And that's why they're not the one that did it. That means more that they're anxious, yeah. So funnily enough, this provocative thing uh, it does create a relaxed thing because it's, you know, make a little theater and it's not a big deal. So Pravajaya, I suggest to you, although your sound is not too good, but do it. You'll see it's not, it's not as terrible as what it seems from the outside. Yeah. But I don't know yes. if you believe me. Yes, sir. I would definitely try it because uh, I do agree with the second-hand anxiousness that you just men mentioned, because uh, listening to your conversation with others, I was getting quite anxious, like, oh my God, how will I answer this if I were asked that question? And I well, will definitely, yes. Well, I'll I tell you what, first of all, why don't you put your camera on? I love to make sure people are people and not robots. Can you put your camera on? No. Okay. Oh, she's gone. Oh yeah. Okay. How, oh, you're a human being. Congratulations. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I tell you, you want to make a little experience short? Sure, sir. Yeah, a little. Okay, good. You're going to tell me, suppose you come to see me for a consultation. Okay. Now, if you come to see me beforehand, I, I'll tell you, uh, but now I won't warn you long in advance, but I tell person, Prepare a question that for you is interesting, uh, important, something, you know, important for your life, relation, or I don't care what. And you come up with that question, okay? A simple question that for you would be interesting to discuss. Could you now 
give a question that could be interesting for you? Right now, what's uh, going on with me, I think the most interesting question I can come up with is how do you deal with people you don't want to deal with? Okay, that is well, that's, in okay. L that's fine. Let me repeat it to make sure we're together. How do you deal with people you don't want to deal with? We're good? Yes, sir. All right. So, okay, so let's, I show you a bit the process. Yes, okay. So if you don't want to deal with them, do you agree? There must be a reason why you don't want to deal with them. Do you agree with me? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you know, maybe there are different reasons, but do you know the main reason why you don't want to deal with these people? Sometimes it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable, okay? Huh? So you don't want to deal with these people because it's uncomfortable. We're good? Yes, sir. Now, somebody that doesn't want uncomfortable situation, what is the value this person uh, appreciates? Comfort, it's simple. Please. Exactly. Keep your logic. Comfort, yeah? So you see, I don't know much about Pravalia. Which, which one is your first name, Pravalia or Pande? Pravajya, sir. Pravajya. Okay, Pravajya. Pravajya. Yes. So, but I don't know much about Pravajya, but I learned one thing about her. She likes comfort. Yeah? Yes, sir. Does that, does that surprise you that you like comfort? Or no, you know, I like comfort. It's an important value for me. I, I already know that, but uh, okay. it's okay, quite fine. disturbing as well. Uh, that's fine. Well, what is your job in life? Do you, have a, do you have a job? Sir, I have recently completed my master's in philosophy. Okay. Well, uh, imagine, for example, uh, so you, you study, you, you don't, you, yes, did, you ever, did you ever teach? No, sir, not yet. No, but it's possible, maybe, since you do a master, you might teach one day, no? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Well, imagine uh, you have students, yes? Now, yes, sir. What, and you have two types of students. The one that like comfort, they want to be comfortable. And the one, uh, no, they don't care about comfort. What kind of students would you prefer? The one that want comfort or the one that don't care about comfort? So the ones that don't care about comfort. Oh, why is that? So because I think they have the curiosity to know more the ones okay. who care about comfort okay. yeah so uh, a, a student that accepts to be not comfortable he's curious and he's going to move himself the one who likes comfort he's not going to bother doing that yeah all right yes sir. And, and you don't like so much you prefer the first category to the second right yes sir but then you have a little problem you notice yeah, which which problem do, do we have now? So I happen to fall in the first category. Yeah, I like the second category. No, no, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, nice. Wow, I'm glad you're logical. Good. Yes, you enter in the category that you don't like. Isn't that funny? Isn't it yes, funny? Sir. Yes, it's funny. Yeah, but you see, this happens a lot, by the way. For a little rule, I'll tell you often. We don't like people who are like us. Did you ever notice that? Yes, sir. <laughs> you know, the people, I tell parents, you know, they're upset about their child. I say, but is he like you? And after what, first they say no. And after that, they realize that's because they, they're, they're like them. You know, <laughs> they look like them. Yeah. So, uh, therefore, uh, uh, does it bother you that you don't like your own category? Yes, sir. Well, then what are we going to do about this? That is what I'm trying to figure out, sir. Yeah, this what can I do about right. this? Well, then do you want to give up on comfort or you want to remain in comfort? So I, somewhere in the middle, a middle path, if okay. possible. Well, uh, you see, there's an idea of Leibniz. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Leibniz, a German philosopher from the... Uh, 18th century, which says that neutrality does not exist in being, right? Neutrality does not exist. See, it's a, neutrality is a purely mathematical, abstract uh, uh, concept, but in being, there's no neutrality. There's always a certain inclination 
you know? So to be in the middle is just a pure uh, intellectual concept, but it's, it's not possible. You, you always uh, inclined one side or the other. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Just the same way you cannot sit between two chairs. <laughs> you got to choose one. Okay. So suppose then uh, hey, you have to decide. Yeah. Would you rather then give up on comfort or you want to remain in comfort or you're ready to give it up? I think uh, currently I would move towards giving it up if okay. it leads to something. Oh, no, no, never. No, we don't negotiate. Never mind if. <laughs> 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 uh, then okay. so okay you want to okay now you see you already have an interesting uh, answer to your question do you notice that yes sir w what is the answer you're getting to your question can you articulate it sir i think i the fact that i'm ready to move towards giving it up uh, i think it's already making me uncomfortable so i think i would do yeah, and yeah. what's the, but you remember, can you repeat your initial question? How to deal with, yes, sir. How Go to ahead. deal with people you don't want to deal with? I think that's okay. my initial huh? question. Yeah, yes. And now you have uh, already an idea. Uh, you deal with it because you accept to give up your comfort. Yeah. Yes, sir. Do you like this hypothesis? Yes, sir. Huh? Does <laughs> you're very polite lady. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. But the, <laughs> I, I'm not used to be called sir. That's why. Sorry. It's, oh, it's my okay. thing. <laughs> it's okay. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Anyhow. Uh, yeah. So are you satisfied with that hypothesis or no? There's still a problem. I'm satisfied, but I know that the process is going to be difficult. So I have the problem lies there okay but then you're not satisfied because no, there's still no, a no, problem no. okay yeah yes, yes. Say, if i tell you well do do this in order to solve your problem but it's difficult and there's still a problem that is very nice but how to do it right yeah yeah yes so in so so therefore we still have a problem we're good yes huh? okay so we don't have to be satisfied if there's a problem, there's a problem. Okay, so try to, I'm sure again, the problem can take many forms. Can you try to specify this problem in why would it be difficult? What, what would be the main problem? I think it circles back to the um, discomfort that is it is going to cause me. Like I will have to, change and adapt in order to deal with uncomfortable situations yeah okay all right you would have to adapt and adapting is hard for you right yes sir do you realize that what again we learned something about you you know what we learned about you yes sir what is it so that i think i'm you know a little afraid of changing situations of adapting to you know change okay you did not speak about fear now you bring it up no you say it's hard for you to adapt how do you call people for whom it's hard to adapt what would be an adjective you would use for them so nothing comes to mind right now okay uh, then i'll propose you an adjective uh, it's somebody who's rigid ah uh. Yeah? Yes, sir. Are you a rigid lady? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. Can you give me an example in your life where you notice this rigid? Because see, every time I always want to check that people don't say yes just to be nice with me. <laughs> so I check. So do you have an example in your life, uh, a situation, an example, where you notice this rigidity? Do you have an example? Yes, sir. Can when you give it? To, it's not a secret. Yeah. Yes, sir. When it comes to political opinions, yeah, uh, regarding situations, I think I get very rigid about that. Even when I know that I might be wrong and that the other okay. person is might be correct, okay. but the rigidity is there, and I do acknowledge it. 
but it is okay. difficult for me to move past this. So on, on political issues, you become dogmatic, yeah? yeah? Yes. You know what is good, you know what is right, and the others are idiots, right? No, not idiots, but yeah. <laughs> I know that it is <laughs> incorrect, uh, not right, but then... Well, well, if they're not idiots, what do you call them? They don't see what's good and what's right. What do you call those people? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, if, if you don't like idiots, give them another name, but I want a name for those people. Uh, no, I think I'll stick to <laughs> you Stick to idiots. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's a very <laughs> common thing, you know? I know what's right, I know what's good, and others are idiots. It's a very typical scheme, you know? very human scheme, yeah? Okay. Now, have you ever reflected about this issue or no? Yes, sir. And did you give an explanation to why you, you behave like that, or why you think like that? I think it circles back to the discomfort again for me, because... Mm. Their opinions, I find to be quite, um, what do I say? How do I put it? Not very, uh, it's too, sometimes too radical, too, uh, too much for me to take that because it's so different from my own. All right, so what's, what's foreign to you is painful. But let, yeah. let's, examine, let's examine it uh, from a different standpoint. Is there, do you notice some issues, which is not politics, where visibly you're rigid? Do you know some issue where you're more available, more flexible, more open to people think differently from you? Do you know any domain where, no, you, you're not rigid? Religion. In religion. Yes. Okay. But then I have to ask you, are you religious yourself or no? No, no. so that means you don't care. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, that's easy. <laughs> if it's not your problem, then of course you're, I'm open, you know, let them say there's, <laughs> you're tricky too. Do you see Madhuika? Tricky woman, huh? <laughs> no, something where you have a, a belief, you have a, yeah, but you're more open to different opinions. Do you know something? Yes, sir. People's sexual orientation, their preferences, their gender orientation. Oh, okay. And very and, and about that. Fine. And yourself, do you have a, don't tell me the secret, but do you no, have no. a sexual orientation? Yes, sir. Okay. Then, then that, that fits, huh? Because then you have. So that's interesting. So why in sexual orientation, you're open, but not in politics, see? Because in one, you're open, in the other one, you're not. What would explain that? I think uh, politics is something that has a bearing on everyone. A person's sexual orientation is limited to that particular person. It doesn't okay. affect me exactly. at all. So Why again, should I be bothered about that? Exactly. So again, you don't care. <laughs> you you let them say whatever they want because it's not your problem. You're not affected. Whatever they do, it doesn't touch you, right? Yes, sir. Ah, okay. So again, we cannot take it, you see? <laughs> so, no, something where you are concerned, but you remain open. Or nothing. And I think, no, no, I think that, that would be, um, how should I say, the education system? I would say, but then I do have quite rigid opinions that would disqualify. Wait, 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 wait. Edu let, let's try. The, Educa the, ed educational, educational policy, yeah? Yes, sir. Yes. You sir. have ideas about it, yeah? Yes, sir. But then I am quite open to... Wait, 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 wait. wait. Just slow down. Do you tend to rush? Ah, a little bit, yes. <laughs> oh, a little bit. I love this little bit. <laughs> Well, why, why, why do you rush? I think I have too much to say. Maybe that's why. I don't know. Yeah, too much to say. All right. Do you have a word in India for people who have too much to say? Mm. <laughs> yeah, yes, we do have a... 
What, 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 do you call them? what do you call them? See, I know who, someone who speaks a lot is called a barbola, but then that is uh, different what? from... What's the word? Sir, it is for someone who speaks a lot. Oh, yeah, uh, but so you, you called, use the word? Yes, a barbola. Barbola, okay. Barbola yes, is someone that speaks my, too much. Wait, wait, yeah, wait. Colloquial language. Hey, wh when do you take time to breathe? Slow down, slow down. So, Borbola in India is someone that speaks too much, yeah? Yes, sir. And you are a Borbola yourself, yeah? A little bit, yeah. You notice, again, you use a little bit. You notice that? Yes, sir. You know what's the function of this adverb, little bit? Yes, you know sir. what it is? What is it? So I think uh, someone who doesn't want to accept the whole thing just says a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, not bad, not bad. But do, do you know how to call that technique, how it's called? No, sir. Okay, it's called euphemism. You soften. Ah. Euphemism, yeah? You know, yes, you sir. soften in order to, well, you know, like, do you cheat on me, Romeo, as Juliet? Eh, a little bit, you know? <laughs> I, I don't really want to admit. I'll just say a little bit, you know? Like, or sometimes, as Madalika <laughs> said. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes, yeah. Okay, so it's a way to avoid saying yes, yeah? Yes. Uh, but uh, why is it you want to speak so much? Maybe because... Uh... Sometimes we don't get to speak a lot at certain places. So it, uh -huh. you know. Wait, 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 wait. Some people stop you from speaking. Sometimes, yeah. Who, who, or, sometimes or often? No, I think this would be sometimes only. Not okay. often. If it's sometimes, sometimes, we don't care. Yeah, okay. But in general, you can speak as much as you want or no? In See, I can speak oh. freely in okay. comfortable See. surfaces. Pravaya, try to answer me. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Stay with I know it, it won't last too long, but for now, stay with it. In general, you can yes, speak sir. as much as you want to know. Yes, sir. When given the yes. opportunity, yes. Uh, don't, 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 no, no, no. You see, now you're negotiating. You're being tricky. No. <laughs> I don't want condition. In general, in your life, uh, do you, can you speak as much as you want or no? No. No, then. Oh. Somebody stopping you. Sometimes myself. No, I stop sometimes. myself. No. no. See, ah. the problem is you want so much to speak, you don't even pay attention to your own words. You know this? Yes, sir. Do you know what's happening in your mind? Can you please tell me? It's called chaos. Yeah? Ah. And often people that speak too much. It's chaotic in their mind, so they're not temperate. They're not measured. It's, it's chaos and words come out a lot. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Now, let's try to make a connection. Do you know why chaotic people are rigid? Yes, sir. Well, imagine. Why would a chaotic person become rigid in certain moments? Try to figure out a hypothesis. Maybe because there is a lack of clarity. And what will be the function of this rigidity then? Yeah, your idea is good. Just, well, you, you, you almost said it. Well, because at that point, they have a clear position. See? They have chaos in their mind. But when they have something position, they want to stick to it because at least I have something clear. And if I have to rethink it, I'm going to go crazy. At least uh, I have something in my life which is clear cut. It's my political opinion. Does it surprise you how the confusion of the mind goes well with the rigidity on certain issues? Yes, sir. But it's nice. Go ahead. Sir, I hadn't uh, heard about that. And that's why you came to philosophy consultation to discover things about your thinking. But 
It's a very common phenomenon, uh, Pravajaya, where people who are chaotic, they will be rigid on certain things because at least there, they have the impression that there's something to hang on to in the chaos of their mind. Yeah? Yes, yes. Yeah? And to, if they would have to renegotiate those positions, they know who, who knows what's going to happen. I'm going to go crazy again. Yeah? Yes. So, this was a mini consultation. Did you like it? Yes, sir. Tell me why. Because it's hope. Clarity is one thing. I yeah. did not have clarity regarding my own thoughts. And then it has forced me to think more. So, yeah. now I will try to and, slow down. Yeah. And try and to your... think more consciously. Okay, and what's your main difficulty to think? Chaos and confusion would be the thing because it takes me a lot of time to come to a conclusion. Okay. So I... this, you, you, you have noticed in your life, yeah? Yes. All right, okay, good. Okay, so was it painful or no? It was painful, yes, sir. It was, but why do you keep smiling then? You're lying to me? <laughs> because it was enjoyable as well. Oh, okay. It was it was enjoyable pain, yeah? Yes. Yeah, like S and M. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't want to discuss uh, sexual irritation. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. So anybody else has a has a comment or a question about our little dialogue with uh Pravajya? Did you observe something? You think something, you have a question, and please don't tell me you observe nothing. That would be absurd. Yes, Gorika. Hello. Thank you so much for such an interactive and enriching uh, discussion and exploration. Uh, I have a question from your... Uh, you said something in the previous, uh, in the first part of the session. You mentioned that uh, you have to pretend to be a non-subject if you are a counselor. And uh, I would like to know more about it. And how can you pretend to be a non-subject? Uh, does it entail, because there was one more thing you said that it, uh, you have to be free of yourself. You have to be a non-subject. And I am stuck on this thing that how can you pretend to be a non-subject? Well, did you ever have situations in your life where you had to abstain from uh, speaking your mind or showing your emotions? Yes, I have. What was the context, for example? Oh, I must have had a I must have had a confrontation with my mother, okay. and I had to stop myself from okay. saying things. Okay, so I imagine it means your mother is emotional, yeah. Yes. 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 Very. very. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, that goes a lot with mothers, but anyway, yeah. And and you, you know, as a daughter, you restrained yourself from expressing yourself right yes so in a way you you became a sort of non-subject your mother was very subjective expressing yourself and you sort of uh, uh uh you you censored your subjectivity your thoughts your emotion make sense yes makes well, sense there you go you see but you have as well the experience but <laughs> you know first Wait, wait, but don't worry, don't worry, just, just, yeah. Okay. But do you, do you see already through that, after you can tell me another problem, but do you see already that through that experience, you you made the experience of being a non-subject already there? Do you see it or no? Yes, I do. Okay, so now we agree on that first part, but visibly you want to raise a second thing, go ahead. But that would entail that I wasn't being true to myself. And it would entail another thing 
that it wait, wait 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 one at a time one at a time we'll examine okay because you 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 launched a bomb there okay yeah i'll tell you what it's very interesting when you when you didn't express your emotion your thoughts to mm. your mother at that moment you say you were not true to yourself right yes true could, could, could it be the reverse that at that moment you were precisely true to yourself through that behavior is it possible to think it the reverse but no, but not but not but just stay with me stay with me after we'll see the but not later but is it possible that is the reverse that you were true to yourself or no it makes no sense i don't understand if i'm stopping from speaking my own mind which i think it's reasonable <laughs> only because i fear my mother's emotions how am i being well uh, look just think about the question is it possible that at that moment by not speaking by not expressing yourself you were true to yourself is that possible or that seems very strange to you honestly it seems strange to me okay well let me propose to you here when your mother does that you think she's being excessive right uh, when she's emotional. your mother when your mother reacts like this emotionally you think it's ex she's excessive right yes something. and you you don't want to imitate her yeah um, do, do you want to be like her and be excessive emotionally or no no i don't know okay it. how do you want to be how do you, if you want if you don't want to be emotional and excessive what's the opposite I want to be rational and crisp. Okay. In my, but you my, want to be rational. We're good. Yes, rational in my point. Yes. You want to be rational. You don't have to add the words, you know. So when you didn't say anything, you didn't react to your mother and didn't say anything, can you consider it was a rational behavior? At that moment, yes. No, not, not at that moment. You, you notice each time I ask you a question, you want to modify my question. Do you notice? Uh, okay, because... Uh, no, do you notice? Not because. Do you notice or no? Like in this case, say, are you rational? You, you want to add in this moment. I didn't ask in this moment, in, in, the, in the eternity, but you want to change the question. You notice? yes yes but you did it all the times why do you want to change my questions um not change your question because uh, in my head i have right. don't don't explain don't explain yeah you, you know you, you want to keep explaining do you notice know mm -hmm. yes well, did, did you modify the question or no I did, I did. Okay. Uh, why do you think, you'll see, when you start questioning people, you'll see this a lot. You know, they, they ask you general question, they make it particular. You ask particular question, they make it general. Do you know why people do this? No, I don't know. It's to keep control. That, that's the way to control the discussion, yeah? They don't answer your question, that would give you the control. That would be surrendering. So they want to keep control. It's a form of trickiness, yeah? They modify the question, like politicians. You ask them a question, they change the question, and they answer the wrong question. You, they do this in India, pol politicians? Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's called power, you know? <laughs> Journalists ask a question, uh, politician says, no, no, that's not the right question. He makes a new question, and he says, and I'll answer it. And he answers his own question, yeah? It's a way of controlling, yeah? Yeah. Do you like controlling? I do. Yes, you see, it's visible. Huh? He want to control. Yeah. So, would you accept to surrender control for a couple of minutes? <laughs> I will. I'm sorry. I will. I will. Oh, don't, don't be sorry. See, my job is to make is to be the mirror. So, just you see how you want to control. You know. So, give up. Okay. So, at that moment when you did not react to your mother's emotions, can you consider you were being rational? 
Yes. And to be rational, can it be to be true to yourself? It has to be, yes. It, uh, it Try to answer me. The, don't forget, you have no control. You give up. So to be rational, can you be a way that Gorika is true to herself? Yes. Good. So when you don't jump into the emotional bath, maybe you are being true to yourself. But what's interesting is a priori you think to be true to yourself is to be emotional. Wouldn't you like to teach your mother to be less true to herself and be rational? I never saw it like this. Well, good. So that's why you came for a consultation <laughs> to look at things differently. And you know, that's what we call to problematize, to reverse to what's called transvaluation. You ever heard of the transvaluation concept or no? Oh, no. It's a it's Nietzsche uses that. It means you shift the connotation of concepts. Yeah. You know, you shift it. What's good becomes bad. What's bad become good. Yeah. Okay. Huh? Yeah. But what's interesting for you is you think be true to yourself is be emotional. And that's when you are like your mother, when visibly at the same time, you, you, you want to distinguish yourself from your mother and be a rational woman. So the question is, you know, which self do you want to more identify to? The rational Gorika or the emotional Gorika? Which one do you want to choose mainly in your life? The rational one. Okay, so then on that day, you were true to yourself. Nice? Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, what surprised you in our discussion? Whether, uh, well, the entire way how you problematized and puzzled my situation and brought it in front of me from a very different perspective, mm -hmm. which was very difficult for me to understand at first. Yeah, yeah, it's normal. We have to be patient in this business, you know, because you ask people to put their mind topsy turvy, you know, topsy turvy. Mm -hmm. So, yes. But that's the fun part too. But sometimes, now it's difficult, but if I can make you feel better, some people just refuse. They, they become very upset or emotional or it takes more time. Yeah, you are not that slow, you know. <laughs> Do you want to add something? Um, I think I was earlier under the impression when I asked you the question that to be a non-subject, don't you have to know yourself and examine yourself first? Well, so not, no, no, first, not first. It's in, the, it's in the process. You see, any consultation is a, an occasion to examine yourself. Yeah, every time, you know, every time you look at it, especially generally we record. I always invite people to record session to look at it. It's, it's like when you do it with somebody, you do it to yourself as well, yeah, to a certain extent, yeah. So it's not, yeah, of course, nobody is going to be able to do it a minimum unless he has done a minimal work on himself. But, but you will do it as you go through the practice. And that's, again, a difference with psychology where you go see, a, you do your therapy first off, not, you know, in philosophical practice. No, it, it involves the other person as well, yeah, you know. In other words, to make the other person think will make you think. Mm, makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? yeah. And for example, in this, in this case, for me, it was interesting. I never really thought about it so clearly, what it means to be true to yourself. So I thought it was interesting. And that's what I like about doing this work. All the time you talk to people, you get ideas. Yeah. But there with you was interesting this idea, what does it mean to be true to yourself? I thought it was an interesting moment to think about, yeah? So afterwards, when I, we leave, you know, I would say, oh, Gorika, interesting idea. You know, I'll be thinking about it all day, yeah? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to you. It was very important that you brought up during the conversation that how I like controlling things and how I was controlling the conversation initially. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, 
drop my assumptions and presuppositions. It was important. Yeah. And are you familiar with Plato or not? Yes, I am. Because you will notice some dialogues he has. When people surrender, then they can have a rational dialogue. When people don't and they want to fight, then it's impossible. So there's a precondition that we accept to surrender. Doesn't mean to agree, but to surrender, to accept, to answer the question and not fight, not say, uh, where are you taking me? And, you know, yeah, yeah. You're trying to fool me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But surrendering is freedom. As I like this idea, to surrender is a form of freedom, yeah. Thank you. Good. All right. Uh, by the way, for people who are interested uh, afterwards, uh, we, we do training. Uh, we have a lot of, we do a lot of training. In fact, uh, when she's gone now. Oh, Yamini, you know, she's still there. It's one of our students. We do training. So if people want to train, uh, if you know Yamini, you can speak to her about it already. If you study with her, otherwise you can write to me. But we invite people. We we're trying to, it's like people who drink. You know, we want everybody to drink with us. Yeah. So if you want to do philosophical practice, you want to train, please, uh, you know, write to, to me or to our group and, you know, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. But the other one to do is, but the, it's, a, it's a practice like martial arts, but you have to practice. Yeah. 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 Okay. But I think our, uh, we were supposed to stop Bala, no? Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, that's a wonderful session that we had. It's a marathon session of uh, three hours and uh, 12 minutes. <laughs> Friends, thank you so much for being with us all through and uh, enjoying the session. Uh, I'll just, uh, I have a couple of observations that I would like to make and then... Uh, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Oscar has uh, told us that philosophy or philosophizing or philosophical counseling is like a martial art. You have to practice it as much as possible so that you can uh, master it. And also, uh, through his demonstrations, he has demonstrated that it is fun. No, I, I, I'm sure those who are following uh, closely and listening to the conversations might have felt that it's, it's a lot of fun as well. It's not just, uh, it is, of course, a, a serious uh, discussion, but at the same time, it is a lot of fun you know, uh, uh, entering into uh, philosophical conversation and entering into this philosophical counseling. Thank you so much for uh, presenting it that way. And uh, uh, friends, I don't know. I, I, I'm sure uh, you you might have noticed this that it's it's knowing while observing, knowing while participating. That's what you might have gained uh, in this uh, marathon session. Huh? Uh, I know there are some silent observers, some of the master students also have joined us and some, some people from non-academy also have joined us and all of them, you know, when, when, the, when, you're, when you're observing, you're gaining the knowledge and you're participating and then silent participation is also a kind of participation to which you gain a lot. <laughs> so it has helped us a lot and also it's not just that, as Indian tradition says, questioning, you know. You, you also posed a lot of questions to uh, Oscar and you, you uh, gained answers from him, clar clarifications from him. And it is, it is always good to disagree. No? Nobody says you should not disagree, <laughs> but uh, asking and expressing it and helping us to move ahead of ourselves is what is very important. And that's what uh, this session particularly helped us with. Uh, we may agree or disagree with uh, uh, Oscar. That is a different issue. But we, all of us, have to thankfully uh, acknowledge that we, you know, before the session and now, we, we have moved ahead of our understanding of philosophical counseling and our understanding of looking at our own selves, need to look at our own selves, you know, the self-knowledge, the process of self-knowledge and the gaining of self-knowledge. And he has wonderfully uh, made it uh, clear to us. And the self-understanding, self-improvement, and most of the times we say that uh, nobody helps us. No? In fact, you have to start with yourself. You have to help yourself. <laughs> no? Otherwise, how can you expect others to help you? First step has to come from us. And uh, th that, is, that is how uh, it is very important for us. And he also said that philosophical counselor is like a mirror. He tries to mirror yourself through the dialogue, discussion so that you would realize for yourself. It is not that the philosophical counselor makes you realize, no? It is like he mirrors 
and the reflection you see your own reflection slowly and then it clarifies a lot of things for us uh, so that is all when you encounter yourself through the process of philosophical counseling that is always a surprise that yamini was asking <laughs> some people come with surprise you no know, expecting a surprise but actually you need not expect a surprise but you would definitely get a surprise when you encounter your own self <laughs> so that's that's the most uh, mesmerizing kind of one to know uh, in the process of philosophical uh, counseling uh, of course there are certain uh, very fundamental kind of things uh, which may trouble many uh, the academic philosophers because he is a practicing philosopher so there are certain fundamental departures from academic philosophy that he has proposed which are very important for the academic discourse as well you know uh, for, for instance saying that uh, academic philosophers are upset with questioning because uh, they they uh, look at philosophy or philosophizing as uh, other than their own selves <laughs> so that they look at it as a, as a discipline a subject uh, a, a discipline that is to be mastered knowledge is to be gained etc so he departs from such kind of an understanding and he says that it's not knowledge it is more a skill okay and that is that is a, a, a major departure of course there are many scholars uh, before him who have said that but he is practicing it and he is demonstrating it to us so that's something uh, that we have to appreciate that we have gained through uh, this session and also uh, the concern no? actually when you mentioned about this kierkegaard statement i oscar i i was i read him but i never thought reflected on this statement that why do people uh, care more about their houses than their own being <laughs> we try to clean our house at least uh, once a day right but why is it that we don't clean our brains and clean our our own thoughts and uh, bring clarity to us this, this is really a, a astonishing kind of one that i heard you uh, mentioning about that yeah that that's something that uh, we all have to uh, work on <clears throat> so that's how he says philosophical counseling is competence based rather than knowledge based so that's a major uh, kind of departure that he is making from uh, general understanding of academic philosophy Uh, which is uh, very important to us and other important point that gaurika has engaged with him in terms of uh, uh, being non subject you know he it, it is uh, clarified enough so i don't want to get into this point uh, but uh, during the discussion with uh, prashant something that uh, mm -hmm. uh, came up is uh, uh, how do we call ourselves philosophical counselors you know, when we uh, engage with uh, in philosophical counseling we definitely use philosophies you know philosophical positions and philosophical perspectives so as prashant was pointing out every philosophical system or a philosopher's thought is a part of larger ecosystem within which he proposes something so when we use uh, ph philosophy philosophical wisdom in philosophical counseling do we have to carry the baggage of the whole ecosystem of the philosopher or can we use it as a tool now this is where again the distinction that he made between knowledge and competency tool skill comes out clearly now if you are only concerned about the knowledge then you must have uh, the knowledge of the total ecosystem but if you want to use it in the course of philosophical counseling then probably you would pick up uh, as he said toolkit you no know, you pick up a tool from the uh, uh, toolkit and use it here so that, that there is again i see a kind of departure from uh, academic way of understanding philosophy from practical way of understanding philosophy this is where i'm i'm worried about one thing reversing the reverse okay uh, uh, since my uh, student days uh, my teachers and everybody was concerned about philosophy the plight of philosophy and then they said the problem uh, is uh, we are only teaching uh, history of philosophy we are providing history of uh, philosophy uh, knowledge of uh, history of no knowledge of history of philosophy but we are not actually making students to do philosophy okay this was the major concern uh, that i have heard from my teachers uh, since my student days and it's it's still continues to be the major concern in academia okay so the, their concern is it is it has merely become or uh, remain to be knowledge and it's not converting itself into uh, a skill doing philosophy 
okay now what is it that we are doing are we academizing uh, uh, the practice <laughs> see we are doing the reverse process now right we move to practicing philosophy okay practicing the knowledge of philosophy now again we started with this practice of philosophy and started academizing it okay <laughs> so is it a kind of a paradoxical kind of situation for an academic philosopher because for philosopher for a practicing philosopher it doesn't matter no for oscar brenefer it doesn't matter he would just use it <laughs> that's all that's why he, most of the time he is quite comfortable with any position no but for a uh, academic philosopher moving from one position to another position is a troubling kind of one so but for a practicing philosopher it's like you can you can pick up any answer you can provide any answer either, either rekha's answer or raja's answer that is fine but in the process you should have the clarity to your own self that is very important uh, for a practicing philosopher so this this has uh, uh, really uh, come out uh, wonderfully well uh, oscar thank you so much for uh, this uh, uh, interesting workshop in fact something that uh, um, troubled me also is uh, um, sometimes maybe kind of things <laughs> that you are uh, trying to uh, uh, ask people to be careful and uh, uh, this is where i see um, the epistemological framework we have this binary epistemological framework where we think that only one has to be either this or that and uh, many other uh, cultural frameworks because you started with uh, cultural you no know, uh, giving importance to the cultural uh, background etc so that's where i believe that, like many of the cultures say that you don't have to be either this or that so that is where uh, the, the kind of ambiguity that kind of uh, uh, comfort no i'm saying ambiguity as well as comfort it gives comfort as well <laughs> that is how you you become comfortable with yourself when you understand that you don't have to put yourself in any of these categories so uh, the, i i feel uh, the indian philosophical tradition uh, tries to transcend the binary epistemology that's where uh, the cultural difference that you are talking about i thought i should specify it here yeah. but uh, actually you have one great uh, philosopher actually is one i studied more Indian philosopher, even though he's uh, well, he's Buddhist, right? But it's Nagarjuna, because Nagarjuna he he plays a lot with his oppositions, and he always says when you have A and B, it's not A, it's not B, it's not A and B, it's not neither A and B. So you use the oppositions, but all the time to transcend those opposition. But of course, it, it's difficult because it's uh, then you touch on something more undetermined. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's called, uh, that's called Chetushkoti. Uh, yeah, it also helps us to transcend uh, the binaries. Even Advaitin position also similarly yeah. tries to transcend when it talks about Anirvasini yeah. you know, in this yeah. kind of So, but that's that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Oscar. And also, we should thank all our participants who have uh, 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 continuously uh, engaged with uh, uh, Oscar. Uh, Dr. Rekha and Dr. Raja, Dr. Prashant and Dr. Saujanya and Dr. Pravadya uh, and Yamini, everyone, everyone has played a wonderful role in making this uh, workshop very engaging. I'm sure the future uh, uh, pe people who would be watching it uh, uh, on YouTube would also definitely find it engaging and enjoyable. And also... Uh, uh, by the way, I have a, a last invitation because in my little village, uh, every summer, since many years, we organize a seminar, international seminar, for one week in August. Uh, it's in the center of France. So it's, if uh, you have no problem with uh, COVID regulation, although in France now it's given up, uh, you know, I invite you in August to come uh, visit and you'll see. Uh, and uh, Raja, I'll present you to the peasants around. You can talk to the <laughs> peasants. Yeah. yeah okay, but it. thanks a lot, Bala. And uh, hopefully we keep on the collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. And over to Mathulika. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Vikas, sir, to please kindly give his vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Madhulika. <laughs> Uh, well, I think uh, half of the vote of thanks has already been said by uh, Professor Bala, which kind of makes my work easier. So uh, 
thank you professor benefier for a very informative and experiential session you have highlighted many important competencies as you highlight them uh, uh, to become a philosophical counselor i'm sure that our participants have also learned of a, a lot from the session but that makes me think if it is really possible to learn from such a session when one has not engaged in a dialogue with the speaker in any case uh, we may not have yield but we surely have gained new insights and ideas into our own situations with that uh, i would also like to thank the participants who did engage in a dialogue with professor benefier the participants who attended it and congratulate those who could make it to the end so with all with that uh, thank you very the, much the survivors that made it all the way till the end <laughs> okay okay <laughs> Very good, and uh, we stay in touch then. Huh? Yeah, we we look forward to the future uh, engagements with Oscar. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, sir. And thanks to Bala, Thank sir, you. for organizing it. Yes. <laughs> we forgot yes. to thank you. Thank bye. you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Bye.